All right, for the sake of time, I'll not read the entire passage that I want to share with you, but I hope that you'll read sometime first John chapter 1. I quote with you now, verse 7 of 1 John chapter 1, where the Bible says, If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with the other, and the blood of his Son, Jesus Christ, cleanseth us from all sin. And now the very basic message of the entire Bible is found in that expression, the blood of his Son, Jesus Christ, cleanseth us from all sin. Everyone who's ever studied teaching or who's ever taught knows that the basic fundamental law of teaching is reputation. Whether you're teaching in kindergarten or grade school, whether you're teaching in high school or the university, or whether you're teaching in a postgraduate school, the basic fundamental law of learning is repetition. The world knows this. That's why when you have a cigarette ad, you have it over and over and over, and every time you turn the radio on, you hear it again. They never change it. It's the same words over and over, same tune, because they know that the basic fundamental law of learning is repetition. Now, you're Christian people, but if I were to ask you how many of you know, know beer ads, a lot of you could sing beer jingles to me. A lot of you give me cigarette ads real quickly. I'm not going to advertise any cigarette company, but immediately you can think of several cigarette ads. Why? Because you've heard it over and over and over and over again. I heard the story once of a preacher who asked another preacher, how do you make a point stick when you're preaching a sermon? And the preacher thought a minute and replied, well, he said, first of all, he says, I tell them what I'm going to tell them. And he said, secondly, he said, I tell them. And after I tell them what I'm going to tell them, he said, then I turn around and tell them what I done told them. <laughs> Repetition three times. I read somewhere that you have to see something 17 times before it ever registers. I don't know how true that is. I've never really tried to prove that point. Do you remember how you used to have to write when you were in school? Over and over and over again, I will not throw spitballs in the class. Huh? Uh, I will not talk during class. Did anybody have to write that beside me? Raise your hand up real high and let me see it. I thought so. We used to have to write it five or six hundred times. Why? Because the teacher knew that the basic fundamental law of teaching is repetition. And if we wrote it enough, pretty soon we'd remember it. I learned a little secret. I learned how to put four pencils together and write four lines at once. <laughs> so really when I had to write it 400 times, I only wrote it 100 times. But repetition is the secret of learning. A great teacher of generations ago was asked by one of his scholars, how many times do you repeat a lesson? Four times? And the teacher replied, uh, 40 times, 400 times, 4,000 times if necessary, you repeat the lesson over and over again until the pupils that you're teaching get what you're trying to say. Now with that in mind, I call your attention to the fact that the greatest teacher the world has ever known is the Holy Spirit. There is no greater teacher than he. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, the Bible says, But the anointing which ye have received abideth in you, and you have no need that any man should teach you, but the same anointing teacheth you all things. Again, Jesus prayed, I'll, send the, I'll pray the Father, he'll send another comforter, and when he's come he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. You Bible students know that when you read the Word of God and study, the Holy Spirit's the greatest teacher of all. And the Holy Spirit, being the greatest teacher of all, also knew that the basic fundamental law of teaching was repetition. And throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, the Holy Spirit, who is the author of the Bible, repeats again and again and again that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. You say, I didn't find that expression anywhere except in 1 John. Well, you found the truth in Genesis. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. Illustration after illustration in the Bible, the Holy Spirit used to teach this truth. Type after type in the Bible, the Holy Spirit used to teach this truth. Declaration after declaration in the Bible, the Holy Spirit used to teach this truth. 
revelation after revelation in the Bible the Holy Spirit used to teach this truth. The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. For instance, let me call your attention to something. The Old Testament is divided into three parts. Three parts. The law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now these, this division is accepted by the Jews as well as the Gentiles, and it's also a division that is accepted by our Lord Jesus himself. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, Jesus said, All things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Jesus himself divided the Old Testament into three parts, the law and the prophets and the Psalms. The law is the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. And in the heart of the heart of the law, in my opinion, is the book of Leviticus. When you study the Pentateuch, I think you'll agree with me. But in the book of Leviticus, when you search for the heart, I think you would agree that the heart of the book of Leviticus is the description of the feast. And the heart of the feast is the Day of Atonement, which is described in chapter 16 and chapter 17. And in the heart of the description of the Day of Atonement, you have verse 11, where the Bible says, The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement. What's the Holy Spirit saying in the heart of the law? In the heart of the law, he's saying, the blood of his Son, Jesus Christ, cleanseth us from all sins. When you come to the second division of the Old Testament, the prophets, you search for the heart of the prophets. I do not think there's a Bible student listening who would disagree with what I'm about to say. If you look for the heart of the prophets, you'd have to go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was the great seer. He was the great prophet. In the book of Isaiah, you have 66 chapters. And it's a very interesting study sometime to compare the chapters of Isaiah to the books of the Bible, the 66 books of the Bible. Now, in searching for the heart of the book of Isaiah, you'll have to come to chapter 53. Martin Luther said once concerning Isaiah chapter 53 that it is so precious that it ought to be written on parchment of gold and lettered with diamonds. In chapter 53 of the book of Isaiah, you have 12 chapters, and in the, uh, 12 verses. And in those 12 verses of Isaiah 53, you have 12 mentions of the substitutionary death of Jesus. What's he saying in Isaiah 53, the heart of the prophets? What's he saying? He's saying the blood of his son Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. If you look for the heart of chapter 53, I think it would be verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. What's he saying in the heart of the prophets? He's saying the blood of his son Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sins. Isaiah 53, 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we're healed. Coming on through the Old Testament to the third division, the Psalms, you look through the heart of the Psalms, and I think I'm correct in saying that Psalm 22 and 23 and 24 is the heart of the book of Psalms. In Psalms 22, you have the suffering Savior. In Psalms 23, you have Jesus as the good shepherd, the present life. In Psalms 24, you have Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords. In Psalms 22, you have, in prophecy, the detailed description of the sufferings of Christ on the cross. Skipping over Psalm 23 to Psalm 24, a psalm we memorized when I was in grade school, it says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, be ye lifted up, your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Talking about Jesus as King, reigning, his second coming. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Now, in the heart of the Psalms, 22, 23, and 24, it is my, it is my opinion that the heart of these Psalms is verse 1 of chapter 22 where the Bible says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was fulfilled when Jesus hung on the cross 2,000 years ago and looked up into heaven and shouted out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And here you have by implication again the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. What are they saying in the heart of the Psalms? In the heart of the Psalms they're saying the blood of his Son, Jesus Christ, cleanseth us from all sin. Now you come to the New Testament. And some people divide the New Testament and make four divisions of the New Testament. Others make three divisions of the New Testament. Some say that in the New Testament you have the Gospels, you have the book of Acts, you have the Epistles, and you have the book of Revelation. I, I, I really like the, uh, the way it's divided uh, into three parts. Just the Gospels and the Epistles, skipping the book of Acts, and Revelation. The reason I say that is because I believe that the book of Acts itself is an epistle. And I think this can be ascertained from verse 1, where the Bible says that Luke was writing to Theophilus. It was a letter. It was an epistle. All right? Just say it has three divisions. The Gospels, the Epistles, and the book of Revelation. Let's go to the heart of the Gospels just a moment. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What would you say is the heart of the Gospels? I would say it's the book of John. The book of John was written that you may know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that believing he might have life through his name. Now, if John is the heart of the gospel, which chapter you suppose is the heart of the gospel of John? I think as a preacher and after much study of the word of God, I'd have to say John chapter 3 is the heart of the gospel of John. And if you said to me, well, what is the heart of John chapter 3? I'd have to say verse 14 through verse 16. Where Jesus said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What is the Holy Spirit saying in the heart of the Gospels? He's saying the same thing he said in the heart of the law, the same thing he said in the heart of the prophets, the same thing he said in the heart of the Psalms. He's saying the blood of his Son, Jesus Christ, cleanseth us from all sin. You move to the second division in the New Testament, the epistles, and you look for the heart of the epistles. Now, it may be difficult for a man to say that this book is the heart or that book is the heart, but after studying the Bible and reading the Bible, it is my opinion as a preacher of the gospel that the book of Romans is the heart of the epistles. It's very difficult to say what is the heart of the book of Romans, but if you want my opinion, I'd have to say the heart of the book of Romans would be chapter 5, where it deals with justification by faith, where it tells you you cannot be justified by works, you cannot be justified by religion, you cannot be justified by ordinances, but you're justified by faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now if you want the heart of Romans chapter 5, I'd have to say it's verse 8 and verse 9. But God commended his love to want us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What is the Holy Spirit saying in the heart of the epistles? He's saying the same thing he said in the heart of the law, and in the heart of the prophets, and in the heart of the Psalms, and in the heart of the Gospels. He's saying the blood of his Son, Jesus Christ, cleanseth us from all sin. You move to the last division in the New Testament, which is the book of Revelation, and you ask me what I think is the heart of the book of Revelation, and I would say chapter 1. I would say chapter 1. Well, you say, what about the chapter 13? It's a good chapter. But if you want the heart of Revelation, chapter 1. Now, I know the book of Revelation. I'm not bragging, but I could teach the book of Revelation that open my Bible. I know it. But I say the heart of Revelation is chapter 1. If you want the heart of chapter 1, you'll have to look at verse 5, the latter part where it says, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Verse 6, And hath made us priests and kings of God, and we shall reign with him, it goes on to say. Now what's the Holy Spirit saying in the heart of the book of Revelation? He's saying the same thing he said in the heart of the law. He's saying the same thing he said in the heart of the prophets. He's saying the same thing he said in the heart of the Psalms. He's saying the same thing he said in the heart of the Gospels. He's saying the same thing he said in the heart of the Epistles. He's saying the blood of his Son, Jesus Christ, cleanseth us from all sin. Now do you wonder why Satan has made a, an attack upon the blood of Christ? Do you wonder why that now Satan has even gotten some denominations to take all the songs out of their hymnals that have to do with the blood of Jesus? 
Do you wonder why some preachers never preach on the blood of Jesus Christ? They, they, they speak maybe of his death, but they, they, they seriously try to avoid using the word blood. I think that even if you'll notice a modern translation, good news for modern man, and compare it with your King James Version, that you'll see the word blood left out over and over and over and over again. You say, why? Because the Holy Spirit puts the emphasis on the blood. The blood, the blood, the blood, the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, cleanseth us from all sin. You know, as a preacher, I often ask myself the question, what are the dangers I face as a preacher? I think if I knew my dangers that I could be a better preacher and I could avoid some pitfalls and I can learn from other men's mistakes. I jotted down four dangers that I personally think I face. Number one, I face an attack from Satan physically. Satan will try to get me to overwork. He'll try to get me to the place where I'm half asleep and my mind is all uh, cluttered up with cobwebs and I can't think. He'll try to get me to the place where I can't be all I want to be when I come to this platform to preach. I have to guard against that. I go and go and go and go and go until I'm so worn out sometime on Sunday morning that my voice is weak when I stand to preach. I face that danger. Second danger I face is a moral attack from Satan. He'll attack me, he will attack me morally. He'll try to get me off into some sin. And then he'll attack me financially. He'll try to get me to the place where I'll look at money and automobiles and houses and property and bank accounts. And I'm just a man like everybody else is. And if I'm not careful, Satan will attack me financially. But the worst way he can attack me is to get me off on a tangent. If he can get me away from preaching the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, cleanseth us from all sin, he succeeded. It doesn't make it, he may get me off on prophecy. And I just stay on prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. And when I do, and I cease to preach the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, cleanseth us from all sin, Satan's won a victory. And I honestly believe that God Almighty cannot bless the preacher or the church or the Sunday school teacher or the soul winner or the missionary or the evangelist who goes away from preaching the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a must in gospel preaching. Amen. Now, there are three things I want to say about the blood. Number one, the promise of the blood. Number two, the provision of the blood. And number three, the power of the blood. Very briefly, number one, the promise of the blood. The promise goes back as far as Genesis 3.15, where immediately after man sinned, God Almighty promised a Redeemer. You say, how did he do that? Well, he said to Satan, the seed of the woman shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. When he spoke of the seed of the woman, you have a prophecy of the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Way back in Genesis 3.15, you see, God knew the importance of Jesus being the virgin-born, spotless, sinless Son of God. God knew that Jesus had to be the virgin-born Son of God, and he promised that kind of a Redeemer. And all through the Bible, every time you see a little lamb slain and his blood spilt, God is saying, I'm going to send a Redeemer. Every time you see little doves slaughtered and their blood spilt, God is saying, I'm going to send a Redeemer. Even when God slew an innocent animal in the book of Genesis and the blood of that animal was spilt and the skin provided clothing for Adam and Eve, God was saying, I'm going to send a sacrifice to die for you. His blood's going to be shed. And in shedding of blood, there'll be a covering for your sin and your nakedness. If I had time, I could preach for six months on the types and the illustrations and the examples throughout the Old Testament where God was promising that Jesus Christ would come. And in one day, not only did God promise the blood, but God provided the blood. One day in John chapter 1, verse 29, when John was baptizing, Jesus came over the hill and, and John said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Hey, wait a minute. Lamb of God, what does that mean? Lamb of God means here is God's sacrificial lamb. Back in Genesis or Exodus chapter 12, the, the Israelites had to get their own little lamb that was without spot and without blemish and they had to kill that lamb and its blood had to be shed and its blood had to be applied to the doorpost and God Almighty in heaven said when I see the blood I'll pass over you. God said that way back in Exodus chapter 12 and yet in John 1 
John said, wait a minute. This is God's lamb. You don't have to provide a little lamb anymore. You don't have to search and find a little lamb that doesn't have spot, spot or blemish. God Almighty has searched. And God's found the lamb. And here he is. He qualifies. He's without spot. He's without blemish. He never sinned. There's no flaws in his character. He's the sinless lamb of God. And God Almighty sacrificed his own son in our place at Calvary 2,000 years ago. Well, somebody said it was the Jews. No, it wasn't. Somebody said it was the Romans. No, it wasn't. Somebody said it was our sins. In a broad sense, yes, but it wasn't. It was God who sacrificed Jesus. Isaiah 53, 10, the Bible says, It pleased Jehovah to bruise him and to make his soul an offering for sin. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Romans 8, 32, He that spared not his son, but freely gave him up to the death for us all. You see, God promised the blood. And then one day God provided the blood. When he turned his back on his own son at Calvary, and his son cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God provided the blood. In providing the blood, he provided a substitute. We should have been there. But he took our place. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. He became our substitute. Not only did he provide a substitute, but he provided satisfaction. God's justice had to be satisfied. There's a crowd that goes across the country talking about the love of God. Oh, they say, we believe God's love, God's love, God is love. God would never send a man to hell. But they fail to recognize that God's also just. And God Almighty cannot sacrifice his justice on the altar of his love. He is love, but he's also just. And in the justice of God, we see the love of God better than we do if he disregarded the justice of God. If a judge stood up before a guilty individual and the judge passed the sentence, you could not say the judge didn't love that individual. But the judge is just. He must be just. He must say that this demands death or this demands 10 years in prison. He must be just. And the greatest judge of all who is God must be just. But suppose a judge got up and he had his friend on the front down in front of him and he said, now, you're guilty of murder and you're sentenced to die in the electric chair. But then he laid aside his robe as judge and came down and said, now you get up and I'll go to prison for you and I'll spend your time in prison and I'll die in the electric chair in your place. Then the judge would also be just, but he'd also show his love. God said to man, when you sin, you'll die. The wages of sin is death. But not only did he say that, he said, I love you so much that I'm going to come into the world in the form of my son and I'm going to die for you. That's love, friends. That's real love. He said, he provided a substitute, and he, he provided satisfaction for his own justice. And then he provided a Savior. What was it the angel said? Unto you this, boy, this day is born in the city of David a Savior. I like that little expression, unto you, Y-O-U is born. Every time I read that, I feel like I'm somebody. Huh? I think God took me into account, and he knew my name. I don't think it, I know it. And I believe, when I read Luke, and he says, unto you, I think he's talking directly to me. And I feel like I'm the biggest person in the world. I'm almost like the, the elephant and rooster who crossed the bridge together. That big elephant and little bear and rooster right behind him. And when they got across on the other side, the little rooster looked up at the elephant and said, Big boy, did you feel that thing shake when we went across it? So. <laughs> and when I read that verse, unto you is born, I almost feel like looking at the devil's face and said, Do you see that bridge shake when... Jesus and I went across it. You see, that makes me somebody. He loved me. He gave himself for me. God promised the blood, and God provided the blood. Now, for the sake of time, I must hurry to the main part of the message. That's the power of the blood. Many songs have been written to try to depict the power of the blood. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Would you over evil a victory win? There's power in the blood. Say, be free from your burden of sin, yeah? Get the victory over evil, yeah? How? Through the blood. What is the power of the blood? Very quickly, number one, there's the power of forgiveness in the blood. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible said, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Did you know a lot of Christians don't believe this? Did you know a lot of fundamentalists don't believe this? Did you know that for years I didn't believe this either? 
You say, why? Because my actions proved I didn't believe it. Do you know what I thought the power of forgiveness was? I thought the power of forgiveness was in my ability to feel sorry for my sin and in my ability to agonize. I used to get out after I'd sinned and say, Oh, God, please forgive me. And I'd cry and wring my hands and I'd get all excited, almost have a nervous breakdown. Oh, please, please, God, please, God, please, God. I was thinking the power of forgiveness was in my ability to feel sorry for my sins and to agonize and to pray and to plead with God. That's not the power. The power of forgiveness is in the blood. And whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. All you've got to do is not say, Please, 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 and beg God. All you've got to do is say, Dear Lord Jesus, I have sinned, but your blood was shed for me at Calvary. And the Bible says if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us. I'm confessing mine, and I know it's forgiven, and I know it's cleansing. You forgetting about it, so I'm going to forget about it too. If the devil reminds me of it, I'm going to quote 1 John 1, 8 and 9 to him. If he reminds me again, I'm going to quote 1 John 1, 8 and 9 to him until he flees. Many Christians won't forgive themselves after they sin. But the power of forgiveness is not in the way you feel. Somebody said, oh, you must have a certain amount of conviction. They think you must suffer an awful lot before God will forgive you. That's not true. The power of forgiveness is in the blood. But not only is there the power of forgiveness, there's the power of cleansing in the blood. Even after a man commits a sin, God not only forgives that sin, but he cleanses that sin or does away with that sin as if the man had never sinned at all. 1 John 1, 8 and 9, the Bible says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, but if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That word cleanseth means a continual cleansing. The washing machine never goes off. A fellow who thought that you could fall from grace tried to illustrate the point to a fellow who had eternal security. And he walked by the river bank and took a rock out of the mud in the river bank and it was muddy and dirty. And he took the rock and put it down into the stream and washed the rock clean. And he showed it to his friend who believed in eternal security. He said, you see that? Is the rock cleansed? He said, yes. And he took the rock and stuck it back into the mud in the bank. And he said, that's my salvation. I can be cleansed one moment, and the next minute I can be back just like I was. His friend who believed in eternal security stood there a moment. He took the rock out of the mud, washed it off in the stream, and said, do you see that rock? He said, yes. He threw it out in the middle of the stream and said, that's my salvation. It'll never get dirty again. The water continually keeps it clean. And there's power in the blood for cleansing. But that's not all. There's power in the blood for reconciliation. How is man reconciled to God? Anybody know? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Bible says this, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Uh, God didn't need reconciliation. Man needed reconciliation. To reconcile means to bring back together two who have been at outs. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 20, the Bible said, Having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. Say, so how we reconcile through the blood? Our sin separated us from God, and we're a long distance from God. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 13, the Bible says, Ye who were sometimes afar off have been brought nigh by the blood. The Greek word nigh is E-G-G-U-S. It means to squeeze. Ye who were sometimes afar off have been squeezed up close by the blood. It's wonderful, isn't it? That's almost enough to make a Presbyterian shout, isn't it? Huh? Listen. You who are far off have been made nigh by the blood. Reconciliation, the power of reconciliation. How? Jesus died for me. He shed his blood for my sin. God sees the shed blood of Jesus. He knows my sins are gone, and he receives me back on the basis of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Not only is there power for forgiveness in the blood, not only is there power for cleansing in the blood, not only does the power have power to reconcile us to God, but the blood has power to do something else. The blood has power to redeem us. Did you know that every man who is saved is redeemed? Say, I'm going to say something else. Did you know every man that's not saved is redeemed? Oh, you say, now you're saying everybody's saved. No, I said everybody's redeemed. To redeem means to buy with a price. When Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the price, who did he pay it for? 
God so loved the elect that he gave his only begotten son? Or did it say God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son? Which does it say? Hebrews 2 9 says that he tasted death for a few men, few men, or does it say he tasted death for every man? Every man. Does 1 John say he is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world? Or does it just say he's a propitiation for our sins? When Jesus died, he died for everybody. He died for the man who spits in his face. When Jesus Christ died, he died for the man who curses him. When Jesus Christ died, he died for the atheist. He died for the fellow who shakes his fist in his face and says, There is no God! Jesus died for that man too. There's not a man under God's heaven that Jesus didn't die for. There's not a man under God's heaven that the blood of Jesus wasn't shed for. There's not a man under heaven that hadn't been bought with the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, wait a minute. He bought us. That means one day that we belong to somebody else and Jesus came along and he paid the price. He said, I'll take them. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19 says, You were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word precious means valuable. Say, so you know you were bought at infinite cost. You were bought with the precious blood, the valuable blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. He bought you. He owned you. He paid for you. He didn't make the down payment like some religions teach. They say, Jesus died for you to get you started on your way to heaven, but you've got to sort of keep up the installments by keeping the Ten Commandments and going to church and receiving sacraments and so on. No, he didn't pay the down payment. He paid it, period. When he cried out on the cross in John 19, 30, it is finished, you know what he meant? He meant it's finished. You know what finished means? That means that's the end of it. When salvation plan was finished, that means nothing else has to be done. That means nothing else can be done. You listening? He redeemed us. He bought us. Notice what they were redeemed from. I bet you've never noticed it. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18. The Bible said we were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from the vain conversation received from the tradition of our fathers. He redeemed them from religiousness. They had a vain manner of life based on the tradition of the fathers. And he bought them from that. Did you know that? You may never come to Jesus Christ. You may never be saved, but I'm going to tell you something. You could be. You don't need anything but the blood. And it's already been shed. Listen while a musician comes. He's already died for you. He's already paid what you owe. There's nothing else to do. All you do is come to Jesus Christ and say... I believe you died for me. I believe you paid what I owe and the best I know how. I'll receive you. I'll trust you and you'll be saved. Amen. Dr. A.J. Gordon tells a touching story. Dr. A.J. Gordon was pastoring in Boston. And he'd been studying on a Saturday. And he'd studied until his eyes were tired from reading and studying. And they were red. And Dr. Gordon closed his Bible and decided to take a walk. He walked out of the office and down the street. And after a little while, he saw a child coming from the field. He had a cage in his hand, and in the cage were some field birds. And Dr. Gordon walked up to him and said, Sonny, boy, what do you have there? And he said, oh, just some birds. He said, where'd you get them? He said, I trapped them. Dr. Gordon said, what are you going to do with them? He said, I'm going to play with them. Dr. Gordon said, what are you going to do after you get through playing with them? He said, I'm going to feed them to my cat. And Dr. Gordon's heart was crushed. And he looked at the cage and the little field birds who had been wild were not making a sound. They were just down the bottom of the cage. If you've ever trapped the little wild birds, you know how they do. They won't chirp. They won't make a sound. And they went down the bottom of the cage without a sound. You could see their little hearts vibrate in their bodies. Dr. Gordon couldn't stand the thoughts of those little field birds being fed to a cat. He tried to hold back the tears and he looked at the fellow and he said, <clears throat> Sonny boy, would you sell me those birds? Oh, he said, uh, Mister, you don't want these birds. Oh, he said, yes, I really want them. He said, would you sell them to me? Well, he said, Mister, you don't want these birds. He said, they're just field birds and you can go trap some field birds. 
Oh, he said, no, I want those birds. I really want those birds in that cage. Oh, he said, mister, you don't want these birds. Oh, he said, yes, I want them, and I'm willing to pay you for them. And he pulled the money out of his pocket and said, how much do you want for those birds? I'm willing to pay you. What have you asked? The boy said, mister, they're not canaries. They can't sing. He said, I don't care whether they're singing or not. He said, I, I want those birds. How much? How much you want for them? Finally, the boy said, well, if you insist, he said, I'll sell them to you for two dollars, and I'll give you the cage. Dr. Gordon said, he pulled off two dollars, and handed the little fella, he took the cage of birds, and began to walk on down the street. After several steps, the little boy looked back to see what the crazy man wanted with the birds. Dr. Gordon holding the birds in the cage and looking at them, and here they was, fighting, fighting to the point they couldn't make a sound looking up at Dr. Gordon as if to know they were going to their death. Dr. Gordon, after a few blocks, turned in a little alleyway. He walked to an opening. He looked to see that nobody was looking. And Dr. Gordon opened the door of the cage. He said, fly out, little birds. Fly out, little birds. But they were so afraid they wouldn't fly. Dr. Gordon tapped the bottom of the cage. He said, fly out, little birds. You're free. Fly out, little birds. You're free. Dr. Gordon said, one by one, the little bird got up and shook himself and as if in disbelief and went to the opening in the cage and out he went. Dr. Gordon said, one by one, as they flew out the cage, he said, I, he said it seems as if they said, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. And nothing flew out. As if to say, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. As they'd chirp and make their way towards heaven, redeemed, redeemed. You know, I read that story and I pictured myself as in a cage. Thousands of years ago, Satan trapped us. He said to Eve, Thou shalt not surely die. And Eve believed him and disobeyed God. And Satan trapped us. And Jesus saw us in our hopeless condition. Jesus saw us in our helpless condition. And one day, in a broad sense, he came to Satan and said, What are you going to do with those birds? And Satan said, I'm going to play with them. And after you're through playing with them, what are you going to do with those birds? And Satan said, I'm going to torment them eternally in hell. And Jesus said, Would you sell them to me? You don't want these birds. Why, if you buy these birds, they'll nail you to the cross. If you buy these birds... They'll pat a crown of thorns and they'll push it down on your back. You don't want these birds. If you buy these birds, some of them won't even live for you. You don't want these birds. If you buy these birds, they'll beat you with a lash. And they'll spit in your face and pluck your beard out. You don't want these birds. <laughs> Jesus said, I know, I know, I know, I know, but I want them. I want them. Will you sell them to me? And Satan just gritting his teeth and spitting him. And blowing through his nostrils, looked at God and said, I'll sell them to you. And Jesus said, I'll pile up all the silver. And Satan said, no. And Jesus said, I'll pile up all the gold. And Satan said, no, no. And finally, Jesus said, I'll lay down my life. I'll die for one. And 2,000 years ago, friend, listen. When they took that whip and beat him across the back and plowed 195 little furrows until you could see the ribs, he was opening the door of that cage. But on the cross, he cried, My God, why have you forsaken me? was open the door of that cage. I didn't know it till I was 11 years old. At 11 years old, I was still afraid and shaking and my heart trembled. I didn't know the door had been opened. But at 11 years old, Jesus took his nail pierced hand and tapped the bottom of the cage and said, Go on, little bird, you're free. I couldn't believe it. 
You mean I just trust the Lord Jesus and rely on Him and lean on Him and I'm, I'm free? Yeah, go on, little bird. You're free. And this morning He's saying to someone here, the cage is open. You're free. But you, the little birds won't fly out. Would you try it? I know it's unbelievable. I don't hardly believe it either. It's unbelievable to believe that all I got to do is just say I'm a sinner and you died for me and from this minute on I'll depend on you. It's hard to believe that I'm going to get heaven and golden streets and pearly gates just for that. But as unbelievable as it is, it's true. The door is open. Fly out, little bird, you're redeemed. Let's stand together, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blood, the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Speak to hearts across this room as we extend the invitation now. And help men to come and trust your Savior and boys and girls and women. Help those who have been saved to take their stand with Christ. Those who've never received believers' baptism to come and present themselves for believers' baptism. I'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. Let me ask this question before the choir sings. How many of you in here know that when Jesus died, he opened the gate? He redeemed you. He bought you. And the Bible said, If the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. How many of you know you're saved and you're on your way to heaven and you know it for sure? Raise your hand real high and let me see it quickly.